Hey students, this is week 15. I'm Mr. Moore, and I'm here to talk to you guys in our government class about the fourth estate, the role of the media in American public life. It turns out that we have so many different sources of information in our world today that some of us wonder which ones are the most accurate, which ones can we trust, and does the media help the average American to stay informed about what's going on in the world? Or do they have too much control on what information gets out to the general population? If you control that bottleneck of information, then you control the economy, you control political ideas, you might even control what's happening in our country by what's being reported. There's a lot of people who wonder, can we trust news sources or which news sources? Having those doubts in our minds also creates a problem um, because a lot of Americans get, get um, very anxious and some of them get also a lot of apathy uh, when it comes to politics because they're not sure if the information they're getting is being skewed or if it's bias. Um, a couple of days ago, right before I was recording this, um, we're in the year 2020, and I, I heard about the U.S. government filing uh, an antitrust lawsuit against Google. I'm very interested to see how that turns out because it's one example of the power of one company to control information on the Internet. Now, Google, of course, will claim um, that they're helping the Internet to be a better place by allowing people to be able to search and use their technology to find websites and access information around the world. But some might claim that because Google controls, you know, the vast majority of the internet traffic and their web browser, Google Chrome, controls, uh, is, is the most, you know, percentage wise, the most widely used web browser, then Google might have an unfair advantage of controlling the information, media, what gets searched, what websites are found, Etc. And so that kind of is just one example uh, of understanding um, what we're talking about when we talk about the fourth estate. If you live in a democracy, if you live in a republic, in a country where people have a voice or they should have a voice, then it's important to understand how information is distributed and make sure that that is a part of the democratic process. And that's what we're going to focus here on during week 15 on the media. This is just a little timeline uh, of, of like how media has been used in the US presidency. If you go back to the 1800s, you'd find presidential candidates going by train from town to town and giving speeches, posters, pins, uh, you know, those kind of things. But um, when we're talking about electronic media, we definitely start in the 1900s. This little timeline reminds us that Calvin Coolidge uh, became the first president to use the radio in an election, right? And uh, by the 1950s, uh, Eisenhower became the first candidate to use television, okay, where he was broadcasting his visual image to Americans around the country just after World War II. Remember, he was the hero of D-Day, one of the allied commanders in charge of the Normandy um, invasion where we were liberating France from the Nazis. And of course, he used his fame from World War II uh, to gain the presidency. <clears throat> the first televised debate um, was Nixon versus Kennedy, 1960. It's kind of a famous um, example of how television changed things. Um, what people say is when they watched the debate on TV, it looked like Nixon lost. He was underneath the lights, you know, when you're on a, on a, a studio, um, there's lots of lights, you know, to, to make you look good on TV, but he was sweating and he looked uncomfortable. People that listened to the debate on radio, because a lot of people were still listening to, to the radio to get their information, um, they felt like Nixon won. So it's interesting how people heard it. They thought that Nixon won. When they saw it, they thought that he lost because he looked uncomfortable on, on stage. And so people's visual presence in the media 
start to become a major playing point after that Nixon-Kennedy debate. Okay, um, by the 1990s, the internet is up and running in its primitive form. Um, that's like after I graduated from high school, um, we start to get some of the first websites. Um, you know, some of the earliest um, websites that you guys think are old school were brand new, you know, 20 years ago. And the first election where candidates engaged with voters in social media, that would have been like the Barack Obama era, you know, when he became president uh, 2008. Um, so that's just a little recap of, you can see how uh, technology has evolved. And uh, of course, before this time period, people would have gotten their information via actual town meetings or when a president actually came to a rally. Of course, that's one way to do it is to actually gather people together, which they still do today in 2020. Uh, even with COVID uh, in the presidential election, you saw huge rallies done different ways, depending on which side of the political spectrum it was on. Uh, but of course, newspapers, pamphlets, any way to disseminate that information, get name recognition and to get your message out. Um, so social media and concerns about fake news. This is a legitimate thing because nobody controls the internet. And so anyone in the world can post something. And so that's one of the things we've really got to pay attention to, uh, to make sure that we understand how we get our news and who controls the news. So where people get their news from has changed in the last 20 years significantly. Uh, you know, people used to get their news from newspapers, TV broadcasts, uh, the radio, but now people are getting it mostly from the internet. Yeah, there's still mag news magazines, there's still newspapers that are being printed, but even most of those magazines and newspapers are now going digital, so you can get it on your uh, Kindle or your iPad or your phone or on your laptop. Uh, however you digest that digital information. So in some regards, it's great because we get so much access to information. The problem is how is it being filtered and, and really what information are we getting from? Is it credible? And these are, are people where we, we need people to go back and fact check and to make sure that information is credible. Just because it shows up on the internet doesn't mean it's true. So where do you get your news from, right? Where do you find out what's going on in the world? One of the things I try to do with my seniors in my government class is to help them to be uh, aware of what's going on in the world. If they're going to be an active participant in the, um, in the democracy process, if they're going to choose leaders to represent them in our republic, the United States, um, if they're going to be, you know, citizens, good citizens, not only of, of, of our state uh, and not just good residents in our town, but also citizens of the United States and quite frankly of the world because it's definitely globalizing. Um, remember, Google was founded in 1998. Before that time, just over 20 years ago, nobody had ever heard of Google. In fact, it sounded like a weird word. I remember I was graduated from high school for more than four years before Google came out. When I was going to college, I remember people talking about this new way to find information and websites online. And now everybody in the world uses Google. And so that's really interesting uh, to talk about that and, and to see how Google has become this filter for what's out there on the internet. And so if Google controls the internet, or to a certain extent it does, <clears throat> and there's been lawsuits in, Euro in the European Union, and like I said, just a recent lawsuit that started in the United States, and to see if it's a monopoly, it has too much power controlling the influence out there. There's always newer, cooler social media apps. Um, so what I'm going to kind of go over is um, <clears throat> in the last 20 years, these have been the major players and they have a huge impact on how Americans digest information. Again, what we're trying to do is to help you as a student understand 
what news is credible. Okay, being able to siphon it out and to see if it's actual credible information. Facebook is the world's biggest social media, and a lot of people get their news and find out what's going on in the world via Facebook. And actually, the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has been called in front of congressional hearings several times to answer how it's dealing with news and what it allows on on its platform and verifying that uh, user accounts are real people. And there's been problems with um, some people buying uh, Facebook accounts so that they can be a real person and then disseminate information. In several elections over the last few years, um, we've heard reports about other countries that have been getting involved you know, putting out um, messages to stir up controversy and problems in American politics via Facebook and other social media platforms. Uh, So Facebook is not even 20 years old yet. It has pretty close to 3 billion active monthly users as of the time I'm recording this here in 2020. So you can see how the government has to get involved a little bit even though Facebook is is a business and its business is advertisement, right? That's how it makes its money, uh, the the vast majority of its money. Uh, Because, of course, people say, oh, my Facebook account is free. Well, nothing's free. And remember, any website that ends in .com, that .com stands for commercial. And so we have to be reminded when we see a .com that somebody's making money and they're making money by getting information on you, right? You like, um, you click on certain things and uh, Facebook learns about you and then it can target advertisements to you uh, just like Google does, okay? It's not something that, it's not something evil that Facebook is doing. Um, Google does it, everybody does it, YouTube does it. Um, They kind of leave cookies on your computer to find out and track uh, what you look at, what you see, and that way they can pull that information. So there's, it seems like every website, new website you click on, there's like little warnings. Hey, we use cookies uh, to kind of, you know, get information and we promise we're not going to sell it. And even in uh, the 2020 election, there was uh, something that voters voted on when it comes to privacy rights online. YouTube is the world's biggest video service online. And YouTube was founded in 2005. And then it was bought by Google, of course, um, has 2 billion active monthly users by 2020. And obviously, YouTube will stream events. One of the nice things is it's user created. Uh, so you, you can have like a grassroots movement, right? Because anybody can go out there, film something and post it on YouTube. Um, but then again, can you find it? Can you get um, people to to click on it, to, to see it? Um, and how do you generate that kind of response? Um, and that, that kind of kind of goes back to that question about who's controlling what you can find. Okay. Uh, so YouTube, of course, is, you know, presidents uh, put advertisements on for, in, during presidential debates and even local, you know, like, uh, YouTube knows if you live in California. So, you know, during the election process, you'll get people talking about things that are specifically on the California ballot. Okay. Because they use that technology of location and such. Obviously, Instagram is a huge one um, that, that has uh, a 10 year long run so far with about a billion active monthly users and, and a lot of people. And of course, here's the other thing. Some of these companies will go and buy other companies, right? So Facebook goes and buys Instagram or, or Google goes and buys YouTube. And, and so you're getting less competition and you're getting this, uh, huge amount of information, but it's all being bottlenecked and controlled, uh, in, in a small little area. And so I think that's really significant. Uh, and of course, Twitter is something that, um, Donald Trump has been famous for using, uh, getting some of that information out. Um, and, and some people think it's a good thing that the president is, is, you know, talking to regular people, anybody who wants to subscribe to know what the president's thinking on different topics or news events can get it straight from 
um, the the Oval Office, if you will. Um, but then there's also some concern that that um, maybe if you fire something off on Twitter, um, maybe that should be filtered a little bit more, and then people take those and and kind of you know talk about them in the news and the media. So those are the big ones right now, but there'll be other ones up and coming. But how do you get your information and how do you know that the information is reliable? How do you know um, if there's facts that back up or is it opinions? And those are some of the things that people have to ask themselves. And you can go online um, and you can see um, the age group of people and how they're using some of the social media, the percentage of registered voters in different age groups who have used social media like Facebook or Twitter to receive and send uh, voting messages or announce their presidential choices, right? Um, So, um, and of course, one of the other things that can be problematic when it comes to social media is that um, when you like certain things, like on Facebook or other, you know, this the equivalent in other social medias, when you like something or click on something, then you tend to only get that in your feed. And so if you never see the other side, the other perspective, then everything you're seeing is just validating what you already believe. And so it does in some ways make us more narrow minded. And that's one of the concerns, of course. Uh, Does the, the media report just the facts? Or are they bias? Is, is, is a news station liberal or conservative? The answer is yes, they do tend to have opinions and they don't tend to just say things straightforward. Um, we have to remember this. I put this down at the bottom. The 24-hour news cycle has changed how and what is covered. It used to be back in the day that each night... Um, there would be like a a news broadcast, you know, the nightly news and people would tune in after work or after dinner and they would watch the news and, you know, basically the, you know, the three or four news channels that were out there would cover the same big stories. Now, over time with a cable television and then satellite television, and of course with the internet, there's a nonstop feed of news the 24 hour news cycle. And in order to fill all that time, you start to get these programs that don't just tell you what's going on. Um, they, they bring specialists on and they chop apart the major stories and try to show the different sides and give different takes on it. And so what's being reported, it changes. Now, remember, remember there's a difference between journalism and journalist who want to find and report the truth. I mean, there's a lot of journalists who who their entire life is devoted to finding the truth and making sure people know about it. But there's also the actual companies, the actual, you know, editor, the, the CEO of the media company who wants to sell. That's the whole reason they have a business. It used to be, you know, how many newspapers you sell. So how would like a company like Fox News or CNN News or MSNBC or CBS or, or, or Reuters or the BBC, how do they make money? It's all about advertisement. The higher your viewership is, the higher your ratings are, the more you can charge for advertisement. So please don't be fooled news media out these companies these conglomerates these big giant media industry is out to make money so of course they want people to believe that they're telling the truth but ultimately they want to tell you the most sensational story possible to sell their stories so that they can sell advertisements, right? That's how they make money in today's world. And I got some great videos. If you want to go back and check out some of the videos, I think it's interesting. Now, um, we've talked a lot in this class about the political spectrum, about liberals on the left and conservatives on the right. And we kind of talked to you about some of the generalities of what that means. Uh, But you also have to remember um, that there are news, um, news programs and news media outlets 
that definitely tend to favor one or the other side. This chart might seem overwhelming, but you get some so far on the left that probably shouldn't be believed. And the same is true about the right. You can get some that are so far out there that it's not really news anymore. It's somebody's political agenda, right? As you start to get in a little bit closer to the central, you'll still get some news media outlets that like totally favor just one side. And they're not going to give you um, straightforward facts. They're going to be very much, you know, whichever side you pick. If you go to the left or the right, you can find those on both sides. You know, some people say, oh, Fox News is really super far to the right. And some people say, yeah, well, uh, MSNBC is super far to the left. You're not going to get the real news. You're just going to get uh, just left political propaganda, if you will. Um, if you keep in the middle and uh, you fall more in the middle, you're going to get a much better, probably more factual based um, not quite as much bias, but of course, being human beings, uh, there's always going to be bias there. Okay. Then there's also this um, quality uh, versus maybe uh, going a little bit overboard just to sell, you know, like actually maybe sticking more to the sources, maybe sticking uh, more to facts, um, you know, complex, complex analysis sources, you know, so the higher you get on this scale is going to be the more fact driven. If you see something from the Associated Press, um, other news medias buy stories from the Associated Press, you know, things like that. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's going to be a lot more reliable. Reuters is kind of like international, internationally known. Uh, you know, and so you're going to probably get a more a broad perspective because they're not just trying to uh, fit a small agenda of American values per se. Now, again, you could say, oh, well, no, they're too they're too nice to the left or no, they're too favorable to the right. And I think that's, I guess, one of the more important things. So could a country like Russia use the media to influence a U.S. presidential election? Should we allow another country to influence our election. Could it really happen? Now, here's the other pause. Er, before we get too mad at Russia for doing this, maybe we should remember that during the Cold War, the United States is the one who maybe started this idea. I mean, we messed with lots of elections in lots of countries because we wanted to sway the Cold War in one direction in our favor. So the fact that somebody may be is messing around or at least allegedly messing around with our elections. Sometimes we need to pause and remember the, 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 the lessons of history that we're not innocent in this as a country. To what extent are the press and the media fulfilling a watchdog role in the United States? In other words, it's supposed to be the press that keeps politicians honest. But if we think that the uh, press is being paid off or, you know, kind of bullied by political leaders, and they're not really telling the truth, they're in cahoots with the political leaders, then that can really make people not trust the system. And that can cause some significant issues. Even the thought that we can't trust the news could be problematic. And that's the, where we have to kind of pause and we have to understand what we're seeing and kind of understand how can we reliably understand, fact check, you know, get multiple, um, you know, versions and see what the real truth is. It's a lot of work. There's no doubt. Over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, there's been um, quite a few times where I would say top secret confidential information has been leaked by different media sources, like the Panama Papers come to mind. A lot of rich corporate Americans and, and from other places were, were dumping huge amounts of money in these private banks down in Panama so they didn't have to pay taxes in the United States. And so some of that information was leaked online purposely, of course. Somebody found out about it, got the information out online. And also the U.S. government has kind of gone back and forth. It depends on who the president is at the time and the administration and um, how things are rolling. 
Uh, but the Freedom of Information Act is a federal freedom of information law that requires the full or at least partial disclosure of previously unreleased information and documents controlled by the United States government upon request. Now, again, some administrations will say, hey, this, 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 this will uh, endanger American lives. Or sometimes people are like, well, it's going to make our country look bad. And some people say, well, if it's the truth, but it makes our country look bad, we still should be looking at that. And so these are some deep thoughts that, um, you know, how much should a government be able to keep from its citizens in order to protect, you know, national security? Oh, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? Like how much? Um, Wikilinks is an international nonprofit organization that publishes news leaks and classified media provided by anonymous sources. And so sometimes people will be, I'm doing air quotes here, a whistleblower, and um, they're going to get information out there. They know if they told anybody who they were, they might lose their job. And um, so th that's always a scary thing if you know that something's not being done the right way, uh, but your conscience says, hey, I, I should step up and let people know what's going on, it can kind of kick back into your face. One of the more famous examples was uh, Snowden. Maybe you've heard of him. He's an American whistleblower who copied and leaked highly classified information from the NSA, the National, National Security Agency, um, when he was a CIA intelligence subcontractor. And uh, so he's kind of a famous example where um, you know, had to leave the country because he was scared of all the information he was letting out that the U.S. government was doing. So how much should a government be able to protect as far as information goes? Or should the government have, should it be an open book? That's the question that we're really asking right now. Uh, so how do elected officials and candidates for public office utilize the mass media to further their goals? That's really what we're talking about. You know, how how do we stay true to the first amendment you know freedom of the press and freedom of speech that's americans believe in that with their entire souls at the same time though um how do we balance that to make sure that what's being reported is true and accurate or even real okay how do we know when it's fake news okay now you might be thinking mr moore just give us the answer how do we know it's fake news and that's the problem is that we have to do a ton of work if we want to cipher through all of the stuff that's out there. It's not an easy answer. It's probably not the answer you want. It's not the answer any of us want. Um, we would all like to go to a source and believe that it's true and know that it's factual and know that it's not biased or at least not extremely biased. Okay. So political leaders in the news. When I'm recording this uh, in 2020, Donald Trump is the president of the United States. How does he, how is he portrayed in the news, right? Is he portrayed positively or negatively? And how about the vice president? He doesn't get as much press as the president, of course, Mike Pence. Is he, um, you know, favorable in the news or not? right? How are these leaders? Now, when I'm recording this in 2020, the Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi. Um, just so we get a little bit of a political spectrum right here, the President, Donald Trump, is definitely on the conservative side. Mike Pence, maybe even more on the conservative side. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, she would be definitely on the liberal side, on the left. And the Governor of California in 2020, Gavin Newsom, of course, is, is on the liberal left side, okay? Does the media treat all politicians and government leaders the same? No, of course not. It depends on which news media source you're getting it from. Do media outlets provide enough relevant information about government and politics to allow citizens to vote? and participate in a well-informed way. And again, in the last presidential cy cycle, there was a lot of talk about fake news 
and which news can't be trusted. Or maybe all of these news media outlets are just out to make a buck and what they care about more than truth is just to, you know, sell, sell, sell and to get that advertising dollar. And yet at the same time, there are journalists who risk their life and their reputation to make sure that that things get out there, that the truth is told. And this is a little chart kind of showing how many Americans are still, you know, getting their news source from the television as opposed to smartphones or other mobile devices who are reading, you know, printed news, you know, like an actual newspaper you can hold in your hands or a magazine you can hold in your hands versus the digital version of the same thing, you know, on their tablet or their personal computer and how that's affecting us. Now, of course, if we want to go and fact check something online, we're going to go through Google, right? So again, that's one of the big questions right now. It's always a balancing act, you know, um, who's controlling the nozzle? There might be a whole tank full of water, but whoever's controlling that nozzle, turning it on and off, controls how much information gets off. There's that choke point, if you will. How has the internet revolutionized, impacted journalism? What are its effects on the coverage of public affairs and current issues? Okay. There are sometimes things that happen that are not reported. And some people are like, why aren't we talking about this? Why are we all focusing so much on this? You know, what about that? So the news kind of, it's kind of like you've got a brain, but the news media, wherever you're getting your news from, is kind of turning your, your neck in a different direction saying, hey, you have to look over here. Yeah, but what about what about what's over here? And they're kind of controlling what you see. And those are some of those, you know, questions. Why would another country want to interfere in U.S. elections? How could they? And this is really interesting questions that are being asked right now and being brought up. And um, my concern is it, it kind of makes us skeptical about the facts we're hearing. And when you can't trust any of the news, that kind of puts all of us at a disadvantage. So there's a giant social media landscape out there. Some of them are more share social medias where you get to share ideas. Some of them are like social experiences like interactive gaming. Some of them are where you can publish information like blogs and wikis. Um, some of them are more social networking where you connect with people and you share pictures and photos and ideas. Okay. Some of them are more um, live streams where you try to get your message, your idea or thoughts out there. Um, there's just so many different arrays of ways to get information. So how do interest groups shape public policy? You know, if you get an interest group that's uh, paying for ad ads that you see on YouTube, every time you click on a video, that's going to impact you. Even if you skip the ad, you're still becoming familiar with it and you're hearing those words or seeing people you're you're becoming rec they're becoming recognizable right how do they spread their message and ideas and this this chart's kind of showing uh, some of the possible ways in this new digital world here um, that we're all experiencing H how do they raise money and, and donate to candidates you know who's funding the candidates that's a huge question right there it's something that was brought up in this last election you know, who's funding the campaigns? Because the people that fund the campaigns are going to want something out of it. In the end, they're going to want to get something out of it. What do they want in return for their financial backing once their candidate takes office? The notes this week were meant to help you as a student really understand um, about public opinion and how it's shaped and about media institutions and, and, and how much we should regulate them and how we discover the truths about what's out there. Thank you for um, being a part of this discussion this week. Bring your questions to class. This is week 15, the fourth estate, the role of media in American public life.